Hi everyone, welcome to the second event that I've organised with Ominous Education. Today we're lucky enough to have with us two people who never went to school. We've had loads of interest in this event, so we've got loads of questions that have been coming in for the last two weeks. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce you to the panel. We've got Hannah, whose education involved world schooling, David, who is part of a local home education community, and Jen, who is one of the founders of the self-directed online school Omnis, who also happens to be Hannah's mum. So welcome to you all. It's um, great to be here. Thank you. Hi there. <laughs> nice to see you. I wondered if we could start off with Hannah and David. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what home education was like for you growing up. So Hannah, you were a world schooler from the age of 11. Um, can you tell us a bit about what, what is um, world schooling and what kind of thing did you do before the age of 11, before you went traveling? And David, can you explain to us a bit about what the home education community looks like that you went to? Um, and just if there was a typical day, like what did that look like? Who would like sure. to go first? Go ahead, Helen. I'll go for it. Um, so yes, I'm a world schooler. I started world schooling when I was 11 years old. And before that I was homeschooled as well. Um, so I've never been in a classroom at any point. World schooling is the practice of traveling a little bit and, and basically just bringing the world into your classroom, whether that's through international travel or through inviting other people into your home. Um, it's an international look at education. Cool. Mm -hmm. What kind of home education did you do before you went traveling? What Was there a typical day? Like, were you doing school at home or was it quite different to school? I, it was basically what you would imagine from typical homeschooling. So we did all of the grade subjects that you would normally do. Um, basic science, math through calculus. Um, of course, not at the age of 11. I wasn't doing calculus at that point, but um, basic textbook learning for about four to five hours and then outdoor time, museums, you know, whatever else you could pack into the day. Cool. Yeah. And what what kind of traveling did you do then? Where did you go? Right. So when I was 11, my family, we sold our house. My parents put a pause on their jobs and we took off traveling the world. Um, we cycled across Europe and Northern Africa for about a year. And, uh, and then the stock market crashed and we had to kind of reset and start over and uh, ended up discovering that travel was something that we wanted to continue to do. So my parents changed their jobs so that they could do them from any location around the world. And we just kept going, but a lot slower, not traveling every single day, not on bicycles, um, but still traveling around the world. So at this point, I've been to all of the inhabited continents. I have yet to get to Antarctica. Wow. And who did you travel with? Was it your whole family? Do you have other siblings? Yes, absolutely. So I have three younger brothers um, and I've got my two parents as well. So it was us as our little gang exploring the, the world. Yep. Where did you tend to stay? Like we, uh, on the we stayed in everything you can imagine. So <laughs> we spent a year living in tents, which was probably our most nomadic um, part of our travel lifestyle. And then we also rented accommodations around the world. Um, we stayed in uh, traveling RVs for a while. Um, so anything that you can call a home, <laughs> we called a home at one point or another. Brilliant. Did you pick up a lot of different languages then along the way? I have picked up multiple different pieces of languages and then not really stuck through with any of them except for Spanish and like just a little snippet of French, but that's it. And did you go back to Canada? Because you're from Canada, aren't you? Did you yes. go back to Canada much while you were traveling or were you like away for many years at a time? Um, so I was actually born in the States um, and, and that's where we were until I was 11. And then we did come back at least once a year to see family and friends. Um, and we spent a lot of time traveling throughout the States as well. Cool. Um, David, over to you. So what, what was home education like for you? Can you paint a picture of a typical day and what was this community that you were part of? Yeah. So like Hannah was saying, um, you know, in, in her experience up until 11, it was, uh, what you might think of with a more traditional homeschool, if there was a traditional homeschooling sort of setup. Um, in, in my case, my dad worked outside the home and my mom was a full-time homemaker and home educator. 
And so I'm the oldest of four children also. So three younger siblings, just like Hannah. And the four of us would kind of spend the mornings doing a combination of uh, textbook learning, group reading, uh, a lot of physical activities when we needed, just had too much energy. <laughs> and then the afternoons were pretty variable depending on the day. So we studied music. So uh, afternoons were full of music practice and the cacophony of four different children all practicing simultaneously was uh, <laughs> trying my mom's nerves, I'm sure, but made it through. Uh, and then outdoor play and an exploration and bike riding all over town and that kind of thing. So yeah, pretty variable day-to-day uh, -day experience. Great, thank you for that, both of you. Um, right, we've had a lot of questions over the last couple of weeks, a lot of interest. So the first one, first comment is, isn't home education something for the privileged? Who would like to answer that one? Can I that one as the sure. mom? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is one of the, the criticisms, the observations about home education. That's absolutely a fair one because, you know, for from the beginning of the home education movement in America, at least, uh, it was driven primarily by white Judeo-Christian um, folks who pushed through some of the laws. Now, it, ha it is changing massively, and there's a growing segment of black and brown people who are homeschooling. Of course, there have always been people of all colors, backgrounds, religious belief who have homeschooled their kids. Um, three that I would love to highlight for people, if you guys are, are interested in learning more about the experience of black and brown people in home education, particularly because some of these ladies are doing amazing work uh, in diversity, equity, and belonging, I would recommend Akila Richards. She is a powerhouse woman. She's got a podcast. She's written a book called Raising Free People. I believe her website is also Raising Free People. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Malika Digg worked with us for a little while at Omnis Education. Her network is called Eclectic Learning Network, and it's excellent. And then if you're on Instagram, a really fun gal to follow is the Intuitive Homeschooler. She does amazing little videos. They're like poking fun at all questions that people are always asking about socialization or textbooks or, you know, all of the things. So all three of those women um, highlight the black and brown experience in home education in alternative education. And I, I highly recommend that people dig into that. There is a degree of privilege for all of us who are making different choices for our kids other than the public system. One of the things that we're taking a swing at with Amis Education is leveling that playing field, building diversity, equity, and belonging. And this is Latin for everyone, and we are trying actively to build a community where everyone is welcome and everyone has access to these different kinds of educational options for their kids. Well, thank you. Um, so second question is from Alex. She says, is there anything you feel that was harder for not being in school? I can I can take a, a quick stab at that and remembering what grade I was in was a whole lot harder. <laughs> yeah. A lot of adults would when first meeting us would ask, oh, what grade are you in? And we all knew our ages, but grades didn't really matter. So we, we always had to kind of count it up based on uh, counting up or counting down from graduation or start of school. Thank you. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that. <laughs> that was always difficult. Um, I think the other thing that I found a bit tricky was not during my younger years when I was at school, but actually later. So as a teenager in my early 20s, um, it was really hard to find peers that were as fired up about things, um, as excited about what they were working on or doing because they hadn't picked those projects themselves, most of them. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole it's cool to not care phase was really hard to relate to. It made socializing a bit weird at certain points. Thank you. Another question, this one from Cassie, she says, do you feel like you missed out at all by not ever having had the school experience, even if it was just to try it for a short while? Um, I can speak to that one. So I went through this phase where I was watching um, TV shows and movies about the American high school scene, you know, and I thought, oh my gosh, this would be so cool. This looks like fun. Everybody's having a great time. And then I went to visit my great aunt, who is a principal, and she took me to school with her for a day, and I got to see kind of behind the curtain. And yeah, no, after that experience, I didn't feel like I was missing out hardly at all. 
What was it that you saw that day that you weren't sure about? Um, it's it was so you know in the movies it's all very bright and colorful and everyone's having a blast and and then you go in and the American school system is modeled after the prison system and actually some of the buildings are even reclaimed right so it's very there's no windows you're in this funky dingy room kind of trapped in there doing your exercises um, and I just saw a lot of kids who just looked like they were not having a very good time um, mm. yeah so. So when you were younger, did you mainly socialize with kids that were at school? So you were very aware of the difference in their learning experience? Um, I did not socialize too, too much with kids who were at school. I had like some of my cousins were mm. in school, um, but a lot of my friends were made internationally. So they were in school, but not in like the American public school system, um, which yeah. is different and then I also had a lot of friends in the world schooling and homeschooling communities yeah I guess you've got friends all over the world now then yeah thank goodness for zoom <laughs> um David was there anything that you wanted to add to that question anything you uh, feel you missed out on no I think that was a good summary uh the, the what I picked up on from from neighbor kids and from uh we we would attend violin lessons at a, a local private school and even in a, in a private school setting what i saw modeled there was never something i felt like i wanted i felt like i had the 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 freedom to structure my day and do what i wanted in the context that i was so no there wasn't anything i was felt like i was missing out on yeah so how much freedom did you have yourself to structure your day was it set mainly by your parents or like was there much negotiation or did you sort of co-create your timetable how did that work for you um for me it the the only requirement that i recall was uh we had to start the school day by about 8 a.m because otherwise uh the the fear was we would just wake up way too late and things would drag on into the evening when we really did have a lot more family activities altogether, and that was that was the goal so but other than that, um, we would we would do a lot of collective activities. So lunch times often involved uh, my mom reading our history books or our literature books all together out loud. And so, aside, but aside from those group activities, we were fairly free to structure our day as we pleased, and all were highly motivated to get through it very efficiently, so that we could get outside and and or build those Legos or kind of whatever was motivating us in that season of life. What what about you, Hannah? Yeah, it was it was fairly similar. We didn't really have a start time, so um, each of us had different times that worked very well. I was definitely the early bird. I remember getting up as early as 4 a.m. and cracking out my work so that I would be able to get into the day and do my other projects, whereas my younger brother fits like you'd be lucky if it was 10 a.m. <laughs> before he started working for the day. Um, but having the time and the flexibility to do that meant that we could learn at our own pace, on our own hours, in our own schedule, um, which for me meant being able to get done with my high school work by the time I was about 15, 16, and also only work about four or five hours a day, um, which let me learn all these different instruments and uh, practice with art and practice with all these different things that I was personally interested in. So it, it allowed for a lot more learning space Thank you. Um, a question from Peter, um, two parts to this. Firstly, he says, if you had have gone to school, what would have got in the way of you growing and developing your full potential? And how did you decide what to learn? And how did you find the best people to help you achieve your goals? So maybe start with the first part. So if you had have gone to school, what would have got in the way of you growing and developing your full potential? I think for me, it would have been uh, the frustration of not being able to go at my own pace. I'm the kind of person who likes to just crack through something when I want to. And, uh, and then if I'm held back from that, I lose interest, I get frustrated, and so I stop working on it, um, which has been a personal character thing to work through, obviously. But that's easier to, to work around and work through with the kind of flexibility that I had. Yeah, the the adaptability um, uh, of of a homeschool environment, I think, benefited me in two ways. And if I had gone to school, it would have restricted me. Both uh, it offered opportunity to, as, as Hannah mentioned, 
work ahead and end up focusing on those things that I was really passionate about, which we'll get into in the second half of this question. But also, uh, during my senior year of high school, I ran into an illness that really prevented me from uh, working a normal uh, sort of timetable for a for day to day work. And I think within the structure of a more traditional school system, that probably would have delayed my graduation by a full year and really set back a lot of college experiences and, and what what I had hoped for a more uh, standard timetable for the rest of my early adult life. And the ability for a homeschool experience to adapt to that reduced level of ability for a season and still be able to maintain those things that I valued uh, w was definitely a large part of that. Mm. Thank you. And the second part then, um, how did you decide what to learn? And how did you find the best people to help you achieve those goals? Who would like to go? <laughs> you don't have to. Uh, so you can pass on any of these. I should have said that. The, the no, amount all great. I just like, I, I feel bad potentially talking over David. So I wait to see. <laughs> go, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm curious what you're going to say. So the question was like how to find things that you want to learn about. Yeah, um, how do you decide what you're going to learn? I think, um, how do you find are, the I think the whole concept of deciding is a very adult concept. I think kids build what they want to learn into their play and into what they're just naturally drawn to. Um, it's not even a decision. It's just, oh, this looks kind of cool. Let's try it for a bit. Maybe you find a passion for it and you keep going and maybe you put it down and you pick something else up and that's okay. Um, yeah. For me, it was always music. I was always very drawn to music. Um, I made my brothers carry my instruments as their carry-ons <laughs> throughout the travel experience. <laughs> um, and finding people was never really a problem for that hobby particularly because everywhere you go, there's music. Um, it's just a matter of looking for it. So I had teachers all over the world. Um, and, and that was back when, when like we were kids, it was a little bit more difficult in terms of finding YouTube videos and the internet wasn't really a thing. So now it'd be a million times easier than it was. Mm, that's true. Yeah. And uh, Hannah really nailed it with the, the, the discussion of play because from, from as early as I can remember, I was drawn to those uh -huh. toys that you assembled, that you could deconstruct, you could see how they worked. And, and so, Lego and all of those were something you couldn't tear me away from. And I would spend hours listening to audiobooks and, and building all sorts of things. So uh, it, yeah, like, like Hannah said, it wasn't so much a decision as pursuing the thing that was most engrossing and the thing I couldn't tear myself away from. And, and doing that uh, brings you to people who have similar interests and people who notice and want to contribute ideas. And, and that, for me, connected me with other people who were able to foster that and encourage those uh, those interests. One of the things I think uh, my mom, Jen, did really well was noticing those things for me and for my brothers as well, and kind of putting those people in our paths. So when you're a kid, you, like you are drawn to it, as David says, um, but the role of the parent, I think, then becomes to be the guider and the provider of resources and and to see where it goes from there. Yeah. So for you both, was it mainly you were learning stuff at home or do you go out to classes as well? Or, and was it your parents kind of facilitating that learning in the home or would they bring in other experts? I guess it might've been a, a mixture of all those things. For our, uh, my experience, which might've been the, the more traditional approach um, almost all the learning was done out of textbooks in the home. And we would do a lot of, like I mentioned, literature and things like that, read as a family together, um, kind of irrespective of grade level, all kind of experiencing the same thing. And that was paired with a, a fairly large homeschool community that we were connected with, which was adjacent to and significantly overlapped with the religious community I was a part of at the time. And so those things that typically are done socially, like theater or debate, uh, were all taken, took place in the context of that larger community. But we didn't, um, but we, we used it mostly for those type of things, as, as well as creative writing and a few other things. But most of the more traditional subjects were simply learned at home. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a very similar experience, especially at first. And then once we got on the road, the extracurriculars really built up. So we would try to, to base what we were learning in textbooks around where we were and what we were doing. So history became um, very focused on, on literature and what we were reading, but also focused on where we were and what we were seeing and, and what was surrounding us in the time. Um, and then for community group types of things, uh, we also dropped into homeschooling communities here and there um, and started to pursue an entrepreneurial you know, pursuits from a young age as well. So instead of just focusing on um, like public speaking through a group, we would actually go and, and practice public speaking in person or um, start working on like writing novels. So yeah, we had a lot of different ways to, to get at it. Thank you. Someone's just put in the comments, does one parent need to be not working so they can be present to facilitate this experience? I feel like Jen's the one. Okay. Can I grab that? I think Jen might have frozen. Um, from my Can I grab that though, one, Joe? Is that okay? Yes, oh, if yeah. you're if you're still there. <laughs> yeah, I'm still yeah, it glitched for a minute. You know, if this speaks to that privilege piece again, if you have the privilege for one parent to be able to dedicate themselves, that's great. Is it required? Absolutely not. I know dozens of single parents who, who have done beautiful jobs with their kids. Uh, I know people who have banded together so that kids move from house to house to house. So people take turns only really maybe educating one day a week while the kids are moving around. There are lots of different ways with pods and micro schools and online now to free up that the role of the parent. And so it's great if somebody can dedicate themselves to that, but no, it's absolutely not necessary. Thank you. Um, right, next question. Um, this has come from Bonnie, two parts again. She says, what elements in your learning journey supported and what elements did not support your social and emotional, sorry, social and emotional health and well-being? And was anxiety or struggle to be successful part of your learning? That's a really good question. Interesting. Mm, I don't Do think I've ever been asked this? that before. Uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think, yes, uh, the, 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 uh, as a side effect of self-directed learning, there is a sense of ownership, which is excellent. And there can be a sense of fear because if, if you're doing something uncharted and, and when I was homeschooling, this was far less, less of a common sort of approach. We didn't know many people who were a generation ahead of us in terms of the, the homeschooling experience. And so it felt very uncharted and because it was self-directed also felt high risk. So that certainly came with some anxiety. Um, we were seeing some other learners who were eight years ahead of us. So we knew it was possible and we knew they weren't dead yet. Uh, and we, and we were continuing on, but, uh, but the, the self-directedness and it did feel like you were writing your own story for all the joys and excitement and fears and uncertainty that that brings. Yeah. I don't remember feeling any anxiety around it per se. Um, I do remember feeling a little frustrated when I was 16 and I had finished all of the traditional stuff and mom was like, you got to start taking some university classes. We can't just have you sitting around for the next two years. Like, what are you going to do next? I was like, come on, man. Like I got done <laughs> early for a reason. Um, but I don't remember feeling anxious. Um, and in terms of socialization, I, I felt like, and, and the money-making side of things, there was more, not pressure exactly, but more of an impetus to go after entrepreneurialism and, and financial security as a young person um, just because we had the time to do so. And, and when you're traveling and you're seeing the things that you can do if you are making your own money as a teenager, you start to kind of have a reason to want to go after that. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't say there was any anxiety, but there was a sense of wanting to push for the next thing because I knew that it would benefit me. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. 
Right. This question came through on Twitter from at Grinch Manifesto, and they say, what do you see as the point of school? And then it's two parts again. And how do you learn something you don't know? Does it require a teacher? Um, so in my opinion, uh, the point of school is to help you develop like a well-rounded outlook about the world around you and allow you to interact with other people in a way that like shows that you understand them or that you're willing to understand them. So the more educated you are, the easier that becomes and the easier it becomes to push forward on your own dreams. Um, as well. So I think the point of school is not necessarily how many facts you can spew out, but how well you can relate to other people, how well you can build your path in life, and how well you can decide what you want to go for and then have the tools and resources to actually go for it. Brilliant. Yeah. If I can add something to that, I might distinguish between um, vocational training and general education, because um, you can begin preparing for a career and preparing specific skills that you're going to use day in and day out. Uh, even in, in early high school, you know, I feel like a lot of the, the skills I learned as I'm now an engineer, I, I, I laid the groundwork for that back then. And that, that feels very different than what it takes to become an adult and a well-rounded human. And maybe, maybe those two things ought to be treated differently uh, in terms of what do we mean by education? Do we mean maturing as a human or do we mean preparing for a career? And hopefully you're doing both. Um, but uh, but to the to that question of uh, what is the point, you know, it depends which side you're talking about. Yes, thank you. And the second part of his question, um, how do you learn something that you don't know and does it require a teacher? Depends on what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think what they're trying to get at is this idea of self-directed education. Um, one of the criticisms it, of that is, um, what, you know, if, if kids are deciding what they learn and how they learn it, well, how do they know what's out there? How do they know to decide what to learn? Because they you know, haven't been introduced to everything yet. Well, this is where I think that textbook learning actually comes in really handy. And that's where the value of university was for me personally was being exposed to things I had no idea I was interested in. I had no idea existed. Um, so it was the broadening of the horizon. And in that sense, I think you, you don't necessarily need a teacher, but you need at least to have a sense of what question should I be asking next? I'm gonna uh, circle back to something Hannah mentioned earlier too, and that's the role of the parents to act as uh, a resource not to know all the things, um, you know, that my, my parents certainly didn't know calculus off the top of their heads when I was going through that in high school, but, uh, but to know where to look and to know what was possible or what existed and to say, ah, this is, this is maybe the search term you should go down this path and, and begin with. Mm -hmm. And, and that broad awareness is, is what may allow you to get on a path that you can teach yourself without needing an expert. Obviously, that's not true for everything, but uh, but for a lot of things, uh, the internet and the you know self directed learning and to end books are, are a really powerful resource if you know where to start. Yeah, and now, like as a web designer and developer, the amount of googling and self teaching I still have to do on a daily basis is ridiculous. So learning how to do that is good, but at the same time, if I'm going to go learn an old folk tune on the fiddle. I have to go find an old person who knows folk tunes on the fiddle because those things aren't necessarily online. So there's benefit to being able to both realize the value in learning from an expert and also know how to start looking for yourself. Thank you. Jen, did you want to add anything in there about self-directed education and how kids know what to learn? Well, I mean, you know, just like when you're teaching your kids to eat food, <laughs> it's when you're like when you're teaching your kids to eat, eat food, you know, you don't let them say French fries, you introduce all kinds of other things. The, the same is true with education, you know, we, we had principle of the no thank you bite, or you didn't have to love something, you didn't have to stick with it forever, but try it enough to take no thank you bite and to know whether you like it or not, 
and then move on. And then also you know, people's interests and in, in changing as an adult. And so respecting that with then re reintroducing things like not that first no thank bite as the end all be all decision forever. Um, for the world schoolers, one of the big important parts of our educational process was to integrate as many people No uh oh we'll come back to jen in a bit i think okay should we move on to the next question um right so how did you approach qualifications was it a barrier that you hadn't been to school and did your home education home educated background make a difference i'm, I'm curious what hannah's experience was here honestly all right sounds good um Honestly, no, it was not an issue for me at all. So I did not have a high school degree, obviously, um, when I applied for university. I applied for Queen's University in Ontario, which is pretty competitive to get into. Um, and the way that I did it was I went first to Oregon State University virtually as an e-distance, non-degree st seeking student. And the non-degree seeking part is really important because what that means is you can just attend their classes um, without having to take an SAT or anything like that and um, start racking in some of those university credits. So by the time I applied to Queens, I had, I think, six different university credits on an official university transcript that showed that I could do the work. Mm -hmm. um, and that was it. It was a piece of cake. I was accepted pretty much immediately and there was no issue. So I haven't had any issues with qualifications. Were they very interested in your world schooling experience and like, did it enhance your application? Well, I applied for geography. So I think they were like, yeah, that makes sense. All right, let's go. Cool. What about you, David? Uh, uh, I didn't, I didn't know about that uh, non degree seeking sort of approach. That's really cool. But uh, I went more, the more traditional route and took the SATs and uh, I, because we were kind of doing things by the book in terms of our state laws and, and homeschooling, my parents could write a certificate of graduation from our homeschool, and that was considered equivalent to uh, a public school or a private school certificate because we had complied with those expectations. Wow. So, uh, so you, it, sorry. So it, it didn't end up mattering much in terms of our my application. So, sorry to interrupt. You're in your state then, um, you were legally obliged to follow the curriculum of the high school, were you? No, not at all. Uh, we we were free to take our own path and, and uh, set our own curriculum. The only state requirement for homeschooling was that there was regular standardized evaluation of grade level. And that meant a variety of things, but in our case, it meant our homeschool co-op gathered every two years and took some standardized tests to make sure we were within the the norms and, and basically not falling well behind the, the the standardized testing expectations, which never was a concern. Okay. And so what was your homeschool co-op like? Was that like mixed ages? How many kids were there? Was it in your town? Did you have to travel far? Like what was that? Yeah, so my homeschool co-op was really strongly centered around our, our religious community, our church. And so a lot of the church members also homeschooled because of uh, an influential member of the homeschooling community attended there and, and really was a, a leading figure in that movement in our local area. And there were about probably 40 or 50 <laughs> kids in that group. For, for the number of families. So uh, it formed kind of a, a social group as well as evolved into more shared classes like theater and uh, debate and these kinds of things. And would you spend the whole day there or was it? Like oh, no, uh, we, would, we would get together. Initially, it was a once a week afternoon where we would do joint science exercises or field games or things like that in a very loose way and then later on it formalized into optional once a week classes for 45 minutes or an hour but no this was 
uh, a very small fraction of the learning time was spent with this group. It was more of a a, uh, a reinforcing support group for yeah. parents a lot too. That was an important part of it. Cool, thank you. Um, another question about um, college then. So when you got to college, did you feel any different to the other students? Um, is there anything you felt you were lacking? And is there anything you felt you had that the others didn't? Well, this one was a bit hilarious for me because I rocked up in my own handmade hat and coat and like <laughs> I stood out like a sore thumb from minute one and I did not care at all until about a couple of months in. Um, I had this very Edwardian concept of university where you go and like you actually read all the material and you're excited to be there and you ask questions and like you know, you do pee tonight with the prof. Like this was how I thought it was going to go guys. And then unfortunately I showed up having read all the material. I asked my questions. I was really excited. And I got pretty harshly bullied in first year because the other students were like, you're a know-it-all, you're being a smart ass, like just sit down and stop asking all these questions that are giving us extra work at the end of the day. Um, so that was really frustrating for me um, for a while. And then it got better. I went on exchange in third year and I found a better kind of university vibe in Europe. Um, and then I came back and fourth year was, was decent as well because you're going into your seminars and it's already a lot more intense. Um, so yeah, that was my experience. I went to a very small uh, Christian university that saw a, a, a lot of homeschoolers and a lot of uh third culture kids attending already so i was fairly typical actually fairly average for my my university experience which was unusual in and of itself but uh mm -hmm. no I, I didn't experience a lot of that just because the breadth of not the not that there was a wide breadth of backgrounds but the kind of background that the university kind of preferred and and gravitated to that university fit well was well aligned with what i had experienced so no, there wasn't that same amount of dissonance that Hannah was describing. It's such an important thing. <laughs> like when I did the, the university experience in the Netherlands, there were over 120 different nationalities at that school and I fit right in and it was perfect. It was great. Um, so I'd say to anyone considering this lifestyle, just be careful what you pick in terms of your university and, and don't just look at the program, but also look at the culture there and see if it's a good fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can I ask a bit about what you do now? Like what, what did university then lead to? What, what jobs do you do? Well, David did quite a bit more university than me, so. I stuck around for a while, yeah. Uh, so I did my undergraduate and then in Texas and then did a master's degree and a PhD in Oklahoma and all, all three degrees in mechanical engineering. So now I work as a mechanical engineer doing machine design and robotics primarily, as well as some education and uh, you know some 3D art as well. Very cool. I did not end up using my degree per se for my work, but I've used it in other ways. Um, so I did my bachelor's in geography mm -hmm. and I am now a web designer, which is a complete left turn. I, I got into web design as a side gig during university and then I found it was really my passion and something I'm really interested in. Um, so yeah, that's me now. And then I do a bit of education as well. Um, I teach for some pod schools. I, I work with Omnis and uh, I work as a tutor helping world school families, um, working with their kids and then also working with the parents. Thank you. Um, right, a couple more questions that have come in. Um, what difference do you think your home education might have made to who you are as people? Like your personality and character. I can take a stab at that. It's hard to answer because we've only we only can run this experiment once. And so <laughs> yeah. we don't get we don't get a twin of ourselves who had the other experience. But uh I'm 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 a fairly linear thinker as an engineer. I, I take a very analytical approach and I think being in a context that allowed me a little more flexibility and a little more freedom and choice. Uh, if, if I had not done that, I think I would have been even more deeply 
kind of following the expected path for, and I think it would have taken me longer to kind of start taking more active control over the direction of my life because the more, more strongly that expected path is laid out in front of you, the easier it is to continue walking it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with David. It's hard to think about this question because any one little decision that we make can make a really big difference to who we are. So a decision as radical as changing how you do your education is bound to make a massive difference. Um, I don't know who I would be without exposure to all the people, the ideas, the time to explore, like the, the way that my education, my childhood broadened my horizons is something I don't really take for granted. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so Geraldine Rowe has asked, which person or people have most inspired you and what or how did you change as a result? That's a tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think. Yeah, oh, go do you ahead. Want to go ahead. No, go for it. I'm still thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can come back to it. No, I'm just what what ran through my mind. I couldn't pick a single person, but I was just thinking of all the different teachers that have come to me through this process. All the people who have taught me different things about music or lifestyle or culture um and especially thinking about um this one person dr jessica voigt who kind of helped me figure out how to start freelancing and how to start turning my ideas into real things in the world um that was someone who really really inspired me and i think kind of helped me get going on my entrepreneurial side um, but yeah, there's just so many teachers that come to you through this kind of thing when it's not just your high school teachers and your parents, but all the world becomes your teacher. It's hard to pick one inspiring person. <laughs> did you yeah. start your freelancing when you were quite young then? Is that something I was, you did on the travels? It's kind of a funny story. I was 14 when I started making money professionally online as a writer. Wow. By the time I was 19, I was the youngest editor of um, Boots and All Travel Magazine, which is the oldest online travel magazine. And when I turned 19, 18 or 19, I mentioned it to someone and they were like, wait a minute. Oh my gosh, we've been hiring a child this entire time. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Cool. And you still right now, don't you? You've got your own website, haven't you? Yes. Yeah. I've got about three things yeah. at any given time. <laughs> Cool. What about you, David? Yeah, I, like you were saying, I think there's elements of people's lives that I've learned a lot from, some good and some bad, but uh, so some that are a, a negative influence or, or a negative example of, of like, oh, I learned a lot from that person and I'm not an inspire, in an inspiring way. But uh, absolutely, I think my, my graduate advisor is one of those people who both held a lot of expertise and a lot of influence and never uh and, and never had too much going on to accommodate even the the most what looked like trivial or kind of small student concerns and i don't know the the person who maybe most uh that i saw in my my sort of professional career balancing uh professional expertise and very local individual caring without compromising either of those thank you i've got a really good question for you here so cat mcgee says if you could design a school what would it look like <laughs> um so i've actually thought about this quite a bit um, i don't know <laughs> how far i'll ever take it but i think the main things would be um, freedom for students to grow at their own pace and set their own learning goals uh, and the ability to ask any question at any age and be taken seriously and not being told like oh you're a kid you're you know you're not there yet you shouldn't think about this but to be taken seriously and, and engaged with as a person and not just as a child you know yeah um, and then also I think just more focus on skills that apply to the real world how to teach yourself how to learn something um, and follow your interest, how to 
understand like financial literacy, more time on the arts, more time outside, and just the things that grow you as a person and also as someone who has the tools that they need to be free in the world. What's about you, David? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, again, the I feel like the main limitation and the main reason people are drawn to alternative education and homeschooling and world schooling and all of these is because there isn't one design. It's an adaptable design that fits the needs of those who are engaging with it and kind of the design evolves with the person. Uh, so treating school maybe more like a, a living thing or a live something you're living alongside rather than something that is a design that you're working with. Like it's not a car you buy, it's maybe more like a tree outside your house. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I think the uh, what Hannah mentioned was absolutely true of the the ability to pursue and and help grow people's abilities to mature and to ask good questions, and the adaptability to recognize different kinds of intelligences and pursue those and and help facilitate fitting those intelligences to both earning a living and and you know surviving in the world as well as thriving and, and helping others and finding fulfillment and meaning. So rather than purely being a utilitarian dream or purely being uh, a, a self-fulfillment, ideally it's doing both for a ver in a variety of ways for a variety of people. I love that. Brilliant, thank you. I just noticed another question has just come in. I'm just having a quick scan. Okay, as adults, do you feel you have a closer, more intimate relationship with your parents and siblings and others who went through state schooling, or is there not much noticeable difference? I don't have a lot to compare this to, but um, I think my family is pretty close, I would say. Um, we still all talk every single day and, and joke around and have a good time together. So I'd say our relationships are pretty strong. And you're working with your mom, so. <laughs> yeah, and so far it's going good. What they say has yeah. not been the case about working with your family. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I agree. Uh, our family is not uh, maybe as close as that, but it's still, it, it, again, it's hard to know because I didn't grow up alongside peers who uh, were inside the, the public school education here in the U.S. Most of my peers were also in these homeschool co-ops and, and, and homeschool experiences. Mm -hmm. And, and I would say that there isn't, if the question is getting at, does this help family situations? I would say, no, <laughs> uh, your, 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 your fam, it, it's going to be maybe more of a pressure cooker. Uh, so if, and it's, it's a, it's a major source of stress because as Jen mentioned about privilege, it taps that privilege and it uses it hopefully in good ways, but homeschooling, uh, and maybe even alternative education is not an intrinsic good. It is a good, it's a tool that can be used for very powerful good, but it's not inherently better just as it isn't inherently worse. Um, it's just more adaptive to, to the learners. So uh, in my case, uh, it was a really wonderful family experience, but I, if I was in a more traditional school system, I, I think my family would have remained close also. So I don't know how, it's hard to say how much difference it made as a result. Yeah. Okay, finally then, um, I wondered if we could have a bit of a myth-busting session. So some people criticise home education as they think that kids will miss out on the opportunities for socialisation. Um, what, would, <laughs> what would you say to that? <laughs> I, I had more friends than I could keep up with <laughs> as a young person. Um, and it didn't stop me from dating or anything like that when I was a teenager either. Yeah. Um, it's it, more like the adult world in terms of you need to be proactive and you're not forced to be with people who you don't, you know, have a, a reason to be around. And just like the adult, adult friendships you make, you need to invest in them and, and to grow them. But also it gives you those, it can give you those skills if you, if you choose to use it. Thank you. Two more questions then on the same theme. Um, some people might say that you need to be a teacher in order to home educate. Do you think this is true? Maybe this is one for Jen, I'm not sure. 
No, but I will let them take a stab first. I think less now than ever, um, because now there's so much more available online than there ever has been. But I do want to state that like there is a lot of benefit, not just in what you're learning, but in how you're learning it. And if you can find people who can step in as teachers, then there's a lot of value to that, in my opinion. Yeah, I think, uh, like you're saying, the how is way more important than the what. So you don't need to be a, a math expert or a math teacher to teach your children math, but knowing broadly about how your children are developing and being well attuned to both their needs as well as uh, an awareness of you know what patterns of growth are expected maybe is a lot more valuable than mm -hmm. a specific kind of teacher. It's kind of if I could add one thing, it would just be that teachers are everywhere and a piece of paper is not what makes a good teacher. You know, there are numerous people who hold a degree in education who don't do a great job. And then there are others who are fantastic. And to me, the most important thing, choosing teachers for our kids was to find someone who was knowledgeable and passionate about their subject because that fire that they have for their subject is contagious. And that's what lights the spark for kids. Thank you. And finally, what would you say to the idea that home education is a soft option and it shelters kids from the normal pressures of life? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a sarcastic reaction to that. I apologize. <laughs> I feel a little bad. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> because like if you're actually out in the real world, attacking things head on, you know, you're trying things without that sort of softer landing pad of, oh, this is within the structure of a schoolroom. Like this is all hypothetical. You're actually trying it for real. Um, so for example, if you're, one of my students is 14, she just uh, got accepted to do her first real writing gig, which is really exciting. Um, but if she fails, she's actually failing something real, you know? Um, so I think it doesn't, it's not a softer option. Mm -hmm. I, I would disagree actually. Oh, really? Um, it, and it hinges on your first, um, premise that if you're inter interacting with the real world. And when I was beginning homeschooling, a lot of people chose homeschooling as a form of religious isolation and often a way to protect children from the real world by giving them a very religiously tailored education that uh, may not have aligned as well with the, the historical and sort of uh, external realities of the world. So. Uh, I think it does hinge on, are you interacting with the real world or are you doing this to provide and create a bubble of safety? Because I think it could be um, a, f a place even to foster um, indoctrination or, or extremism in the worst of cases, uh, just like any family or home life could. But uh, if, as, as Hannah mentioned, if you're interacting with the real world and if you're going out and trying things in reality, uh, rather than in the this artificial academic bubble, then yeah, it's not it's not an easy option. It's not an easy option either way. That's a really good point. I was remembering my numerous like hard knocks and failures and literally falling off cliffs and you know, so <laughs> yeah. But that's a really good point. Jen, is there anything you'd like to add to that question? Yeah, I mean, I think David is spot on when people come to me and, and you know, either are interested or homes, in homeschooling or have begun homeschooling. The first question I always ask them is why? Because the answer to that question tells you a lot about their intentions and, and how it's going to go for their kids. And when someone's why is, well, because I want my kid to have more of all the things and, you know, I, we feel school is really limiting and we want more for our kids, uh, then that their education is going to be liberal, broad-minded, in the real world, provide springboard for lots of things. If their answer is, well, we need to protect them from pick a thing, uh, then I have a lot more questions for them and, and you know, prompts for encouraging more thought because, you know, our goal as parents, the thing that we have to do, whether we want to or not, is release these kids into the world, right? And we want them to be prepared for that. And so it's our actual job to make sure that they encounter every single thing, every single idea that we can put in their path so that they learn how to think and they learn how to learn. Um, so David's point is really important. And uh, the why behind it is, I think maybe the most important thing. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, are there any other myths that you'd like to challenge before we wrap up? Or anything else you'd like to share? I think the myth that homeschoolers are inherently kind of weirdos or strange. The reality is that um, anything feels strange if it's outside of your bubble. And if, if people are looking odd to you, it might just be that you haven't expanded your bubble far enough. Anyone else before we go? That's it for me. I'd love to just to share that, you know, these two young people, they both work in and are learning guides with Ominous Education and both of them get rave reviews from their students. Uh, I think primar primarily because they themselves were educated outside the classroom. So the way they approach learning and the way they approach teaching is very different as a result of that. Um, for us, like the purpose of Omnis Education is to create education for everyone. And that includes people who are in schools, that includes people who don't fit well in schools, it includes home educators, it includes a wide range of humans with different experiences. And so the, you know, the thing that we're trying to do is create options that will serve more people better. You know, because there's lots of talk right now about what's wrong with schools. Uh, there's an awful lot that's right with education historically, and there are ways to leverage technology to create opportunities like this for everyone. You know, some of the questions people have asked in the sidebar about are grades important, are GCSEs important, how are we going to get them into college? The thing that we've discovered and that I've discovered in working with hundreds of other families over the few years is that often this outside the box education ends up being someone's superpower because they have an ability to self-teach, to figure out what it is that they need to learn, to think critically, to make the connections socially and otherwise they need in order to accomplish a goal. Um, and I think one of the beautiful things about technology is it's allowing us to connect to each other and connect to these ideas in a way that we haven't before. So if anyone is watching and is interested in learning more, please send us questions. Uh, we'll make Hannah and David answer them some more. <laughs> and, or, you know, drop me a line. I would be so happy to chat with anyone who's interested about, like, from the parent side, how do you make this kind of life, this kind of education happen for your kids? Because it is very doable for most people. Thank you. And if anyone wants more information about Omnis, where can they go to find out more? Uh, Omniseducation.com omniscool.com. Uh, I will drop our email address in the in the comments. It's just hello at omniseducation.com. Either myself or my partner, Leah Jovi Ford, will get back to you. Um, but yeah, like I, this is my passion in life. It's the thing that I love to talk about and to share with families. So don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions or ideas or ways that you think we could collaborate. It would be great to hear from you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thanks for everyone that's watching. If you've got any more questions, just put them in the comments and we will try and get back to you at a later stage. And we'll see you in two weeks time for our next event. Thank you very much. Bye bye.